Well, the GOP civil war plot thickens, of course, after John Boehner's handpicked successor bowed out. Listen, here's the deal. Kevin McCarthy, he did the math and he realized he wasn't a shoe in after all. Now, the problem is, though, there appears to be no shoe in and now pundits are predicting that this schism will destroy the party. Is it just, you know, good old fashioned sausage making and ultimately ends up being good for the party or is it really political suicide? Joining me now, Lee Carter, Republican strategist, Guy Benson, Fox News contributor and Vince uh, Vince. I always mispronounced your first name and last it's name. Colonnades. Colonnades. No Next time we'll do it phonetically from the Daily Perfect. Caller. I'll start with you, Vince. Uh, you know, a lot of debate. Is this good? Is this not good? Is it healthy? Yeah. What does it mean for the election? I'm not sure. My friend Stuart Varney thinks it's a bad thing for the GOP. Where do you stand? Well, it can't be good for the GOP if you bring in somebody who ultimately doesn't advance the interests of the party and doesn't help put the party sort of in like a positive stance. The big criticism that John Banner's received all these years now is that the fight just doesn't seem to be in them. Now, granted, you can listen to John Boehner and say, hey, uh, it makes sense. President Obama is going to veto everything. Why would we even put some of these bills in front of him? But Republicans, there's an appetite, not just in the Congress, but outside across the country, for say, to say, hey, let Obama veto these things. Send Obama bills that need to be vetoed to show that he's against this, right. because then maybe it could show that the Republicans are making positive traction. So the outcome of this race, while it is a process outcome, because it doesn't affect a tremendous amount, could actually have some big ramifications for the well, future I mean, of the, party. It, the guy will affect, uh, you know, there are a lot of important decisions that have to be made very soon on Capitol Hill, so it obviously would impact that to a certain degree, but also the process itself. Now, we understand there, there's the sausage making, but this one comes with a certain amount of vitriol, a certain amount of anger, and a certain amount of, uh, you know, question marks about where the party is once the dust settles. Is the House Republican Party a governable or leadable entity? That's the question right now because they have. Well, the question is, uh, is: Is the Freedom Caucus governable? Right? I mean, is that well, the real question here? Well, no, because the thing is, there's different factions. 247 seats is a lot. When you have that broad a majority, there are going to be factions. One of them is the Freedom Caucus, about 40 seats, very safe seats, very conservative members. There's also a moderate wing of the party, dozens of members who represent very closely fought swing state and swing districts, rather. Um, it's going to take a leader who can somehow calm the seas here a little bit, get everyone at least moving mostly in the same direction without the acrimony that we've seen so much. And I'm just skeptical about who can do that, whether we can see those dynamics actually change. Well, here's the thing, Lee. Uh, there was also certain aspects of, of Boehner's rule. We can call it a rule now because almost <laughs> everyone uh, agrees that it got to the end. It was really, you know, he, he, he was more of a dictator. He, and he was also a little bit petty. Uh, he punished people who didn't agree with him. He, he threatened committee leadership roles or subcommittee com committee leadership roles. And, and I think this left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths. But over the last 24 hours, this has been one of these jobs where more people have said no than yes. <laughs> well, it is kind of unbelievable. I think there's a couple things going on right now. I mean, number one, we're seeing that this is the anti-establishment era, whether it's in the election or whether it is, you know, in the, in the presidential election or whether it's right here. And so this is a boon right now to Fiorino, to Trump and to the others to say, nobody, look, look the establishment can't even work it out in Congress. How are they going to lead our country? So that's number one. Number two, I really think that we've got a total mess in our hand. We've got in the Republican Party. It's like a clown car right now. There's all these people trying to get in and there's no leader. And I think it's really important right now what we're highlighting is these factions. The Republican Party's got to say this is who we are and we, we you know, come together right now. We've got a mess. But here's the thing, Guy. I mean, uh, we know who determines that. And, 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 and here's the point. If you can't get your act together in Congress, how can you lead the entire country? Yeah, and that's the argument Democrats can make. Right? They say they cannot govern their own party. How can they govern the country? That's why you need some figure who can come here, come to Washington, and pick the pieces up a little bit. And I know the rumor right now is that Paul Ryan is looking very closely at this, even though he really doesn't want right. it. That's the key. No one wants the job because as the dynamics currently play out, it is a thankless job. Well, maybe everyone well, over the weekend will watch Mr. Smith goes to Washington. <laughs> but here's the thing I want to go, Vince. You know, there's yeah. a certain amount of irony, I think, right now that John Boehner, it, not only is he going to stick around longer, but he's probably going to be able to make all kinds of moves, right, that are going to anger the Freedom Caucus and everyone else. He'll probably do some deals with the Democrats to push certain bills through. So that's sort of the irony of it all right now. Yeah, absolutely. And that has a lot to do with the fact, by the way, that McCarthy's not taking the job. Boehner felt like he was leaving it in safe hands, and he was probably... But isn't, isn't probably, that part of the, the, the part of the assumption that this guy thought he could pick his successor, even yeah. though that he had absolutely, you know, overstayed his, his, uh, overstayed his run there, 
that's part of the arrogance that I think that still is, is sort of in the air. Yes, and that's what Republicans that are upset about, the more conservative Republicans, they don't want to see that. They don't want a handpicked successor. Even the discussion of Paul Ryan possibly taking the helm has led some of the guys on the far right to be like, hey, now's the time. They start attacking Paul Ryan, being too close to Boehner, that he's going to be a lot like Boehner. The idea is... Uh, all, basically, for strategy, we're moving into a presidential election year. Volatility in Congress does little to no favors for whoever's going to be the nominee. So as Guy's sort of alluding to, I think the idea is you need to come in, have somebody who's responsible, who can help Congress keep its head down so that the presidential nominee can ultimately lead the party. Before we get into you guys handicapping who, who, who may end up with this job, uh, and by the way, I mean, you, you know, you, we talk about Paul Ryan, but I've heard Newt Gingrich, I've heard Mitt Romney, we've heard an assortment of names out there. Uh, what would be the characteristic? I mean, how does that person, could that person exist? Because everyone can't win here. and. Essentially, governing is, is, is compromise, but if your platform says, hey, we don't ever compromise, we never apologize, it's going to be tough to get anything done. Well, you have to be able to compromise. Politics is the art of the possible. And so I understand that there are people in this country, conservatives who are very angry. These they guys should represent. Be angry, though, yeah, right? I, that's they fine. should be angry. Absolutely. But the thing is, if you're going to be part of the caucus, the element of the Republican Party that is saying no, 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 look, Boehner's gone. McCarthy's out. These are two scalps that they've claimed. And then it's like, okay, guys, who do you want? And they're putting up Daniel Webster, who I don't think can come anywhere clear or anywhere near getting 218 votes for the speakership. So you have to actually put forward viable alternatives at some point. You can't just be backbenchers if you want to lead. But, but Lee, I, I don't think it's just the scalps that they want uh, of the individuals. I think they want the philosophical scalp also. Uh, listen, acknowledge us, recognize us, uh, help us out, because so far we've been marginalized. Uh, we've won a majority. The, the, the American public believed in the Republican Party enough for us to fight. And we haven't done any fighting. Yeah, I think absolutely. What we're seeing right now, I think the reason that people like Ryan is that he can play both sides of the aisle. He's a political animal, except he can be Tea Party and yet not too extreme. He can go on, he's the, sort of the great equalizer. And I think what we need to see is that level head, the person that can really communicate with all sides and seem even killed. And there aren't very many people that can do that. We've got a very divided party. You know, it's so funny. Last night I talked about that book, Young Guns. You guys remember that book, uh, 2010? <laughs> yeah. It had, uh, oh boy. You had McCarthy, you yeah. had Eric Cantor, and, and Paul Ryan, right? It was the brains, the strategists. It's like I the mean, wanted two, poster at a yeah, post office. Yeah, two-thirds yeah. of them are already out. They were going to leave the Republican Revolution. Two-thirds are out, and one-third is like saying, I don't know if I want to put my scalp on the line. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this, because Kevin McCarthy says that eventually the Speaker should get 247 votes, not 218. Now we know that's kind of political speak, but... Uh, who will the next speaker be? You know, I want you guys to take a listen. Jack Welsh, he was on with Neil Cavuto, Neil Cavuto earlier today on Your World. Take a listen to what he had to say about this. You give voice. I mean, the next, the next leader who comes in has to go around handshaking in every office, listening, making people feel like they're listening. If you don't give voice to any organization, you'll have nothing but trouble. All right. Uh, eventually, someone's going to have the job. So let's handicap it. Vince, I'll start with you. Who do you think uh, gets the job and how long does this search linger? I, I, don't, I imagine the search can't continue on too much longer. I mean, this, this is not good for the party. And by the way, the, the, the conservative members of the House don't want to see Boehner finish out the rest of, you know, President Obama's presidency being the Speaker of the House. So at this point, my guess is that Paul Ryan will be convinced to do this. That's my guess. I, anyway. Everyone's saying Paul Ryan, though, guy. If Ryan says, I've got a couple, you know, I've got young kids. Right. I don't want to do it. What's plan B? Well, well, I would say I have a plan A, plan B, and plan X. I mean, you know, in case, in case of emergency, well, we, break glass. We've flown <laughs> through several plans already, right? right? So let's cobble together a new one here. I think it has to be someone. You said, what's the quality? It has to be someone that gains the trust of members from across the spectrum. You're not going to make everyone happy all the time, but as long as people are feeling heard and feel like they can trust your word, that's going to be key. I think what you said about Paul Ryan and his character and his reputation on the Hill is absolutely correct. The big thing that I'm hearing now is, look, it's been a full court press for the last 48 hours on Paul Ryan. Mitt Romney calling Paul Ryan, Trey Gowdy, John Boehner, really people, National Review with an editorial. 
the last piece from apparently what Trey Gowdy said was Mrs. Ryan. Because if you're Speaker of the House, it's not just that you have this gavel and a bunch of power. Part of your job is to travel to every district across the country to raise money for the party. That is a grueling schedule. That's what Paul Ryan, he wants his job on Ways and Means. He doesn't want to be away from his family. But given how heavily he's being leaned on, I actually agree with Vince. I think that he, if I had to put money on it, which is a risky proposition sure. now, I think he'll probably say yes. We've even heard but the guilt trip. He might also he might also be very concerned about the presidential bid that he may inevitably want to run too. Yeah. And being speaker me, brings a lot of arrows. Let me bring, let me bring Lee in because uh, there was also the guilt trip. Uh, you should put your <laughs> and I'm glad Vince said that. Someone said earlier I forgot who that uh, Ryan should put his career. Uh, you know, put the country ahead of his career. In other words, yeah, maybe ultimately you want to make this run for the White House, but you owe it to the country. Uh, so if that doesn't work, who would be the next choice? Oh, I don't even know. I think I heard. So then this could linger for a long time. I don't think it's going to. I don't think that we're going to let it because, frankly, it's got to be over soon because this isn't just an issue, I think, for the Republican Party. This is an issue for all politicians. We've got to get this resolved and we've got to get it resolved soon or else everybody's going to say, you know what, nobody in D.C. can get it done because it's a symbol of a larger issue. If you're in a Freedom Caucus, though, you feel like this is the first time you've had some real power. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you just, John Banner has muffled you, he's kept you uh, under wraps, he hasn't listened to your concerns, he hasn't fought the fight that you've asked him to fight on any measure or any issue. You don't relinquish that. I mean, you play this hand out to the bitter end, don't you, Guy? I guess to some extent you can game it out, but it's still, at some point, you are part of an overall party that is going to try to get some things accomplished. You, you're asking us what would a plan B or C be? I would just say keep in the back of your mind and name Peter Roskam. Uh, Illinois congressman, suburbs of Illinois. He's got a very good reputation and he's made a few moves behind the scenes as saying if necessary you can fall back on Let it. Let me go around the table and just ask uh, Hurt help overall the GOP. What do you think this whole drama is going to do ultimately, Lee? Hurt. Hurt? What do you think, Guy? Um, I, I think it's definitely hurting right now. If it lingers forever, that will be a long-term hurt. I think if they clean it up, it'll be all right. Vince? Yeah, I agree. This totally depends on the timeline. This could just be a wash and a blip in history by this time next year. Uh, but, you know, here's the deal, though. No one had to know about it. If there was a smooth transition, it would have been on page 83 of your 80, uh, you know, somewhere near the obituaries and, and the average yeah. That'd be no fun. We'd have nothing to talk about. <laughs> That's right. No. I wouldn't have you guys on. I couldn't mess up Vince's last name, Colonese. All right. <laughs> Thanks Thank a you. lot, guys.